So one thing you might be wondering is how do we decide how to make our frequency table? Now your book acts like there's really specific rules about how many class intervals you would make or how many classes you would make. Um, I think that it is a little more open-ended than your book leaves it, but there are certainly some important rules to think about. And there's definitely some common sense to thinking about how many classes do I really need to represent my data effectively. Remember, the point of making a frequency table is to quickly summarize the information in a way that is organized and easy to interpret. So we're trying to get across the information contained in those values to somebody in a quick and efficient way. So we need to think about how do we represent that data in our table. Now, the first thing we want to do is figure out how big we want a class width or class interval to be. And a class interval or the class width is the upper class limit minus the lower class limit plus one. So this is what we would consider the real range of the class. Now, the reason this plus one comes into an issue that can sometimes be a bit confusing for people, but it, it goes to the fact that there's actually what we call real limits on continuous data. So if you think about real limits, imagine that you have, um, you jump on your scale and you weigh 139 pounds. Now your scale only happens to go to this level of precision, but there could be additional numbers in the decimal spots that we just don't have the precision to measure. So the question is, what values could this 139 truly represent? And the fact of the matter is that any number that is 138.5 through 139.49, basically here less than 139.5 and greater than or equal to 138.5. So X can be anywhere in that space. So if you had 138.5, it would round to 139. If you were less than 139.5, but greater than or equal to this, it would also round to 139. So basically there's a span of a point here. Uh, that are the real limits on this value. We just aren't measuring that precisely. And so these are what we consider the lower and upper, lower real limit and the upper real limit on this value. Because remember, numbers exist on a number scale. So how many numbers exist between 138 and 139? There's actually an infinite number of possible values that could live in that space, right? It's just how precise do you measure? And so these real limits are part of the reason. What we're really doing is getting the interval that represents that. But the easier way to remember it is simply to note that when you do the upper class limit minus the lower class limit, if you add one, that gets you what you're looking for for the class interval. So if we get the range of our data and we think about how many we want to fit in, uh, this can be a useful way to figure out how many classes we need. So here our highest score, our maximum is nine and our minimum is one. So our real range is nine. That plus one makes it the real range. Okay, so the real range here is nine. So if we take our real range and we think about how many classes do we want to make? Right? And part of thinking about how many classes we want to make is going to come back to, well, how much data do we have to represent? If I have 497 scores um, that span an enormous range, that is going to be different in terms of how many classes I want to make and how wide the intervals are than if I have a small set here, like 12 scores, that only span nine points. In that case, summarizing those nine points, I probably can do it with fewer classes and a smaller class width for each of those classes. So here, it might be reasonable with that to say, well, okay, I'm gonna make three classes. That's not unreasonable. Um, it might be kind of weird to make nine classes because then it's not a grouped frequency table. So remember, what we're doing here to make classes is constructing what we would call a grouped frequency table. So if you remember, your book talks about grouped and ungrouped, and a grouped table is one that has taken those raw values and has put those raw values into classes or groups.
All right, so we're doing a grouped frequency table here by making these classes. So, okay, I have a real range of nine. I wanna make three classes. That is gonna give me three for the size of my class interval. So the class interval or class width is the real range of your data divided by the number of classes. Okay, and so here we're gonna make each of these three wide, remembering that the width is the upper minus the lower plus one. So if I have the first class go, so if my class and my frequency in my table here, the first class would go one, two, three, one, two, three, real range, one through three is my first class. And again, so what's three minus one? Two. Plus one, three, what is the width of that class? Three. Okay, my second class would then go from four to six, and then from seven to nine. And the frequencies for those would come from my table. So one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, one, two, three. Did I miss one? Ah, four, the circled one. So four, all right. So that is a class frequency table, where now I'm representing the classes, intervals or width that describe them, not just single values of x, and the frequencies that those classes can take. And when I wanna think about that, I wanna think about, again, what is the real range of my data, and what number of classes would be a reasonable number to make to represent the data, given how many points there are, and more importantly, how big the range is. Right? The larger the range, the greater you're probably going to want the class width to be. But if we use some common sense, you'll realize a frequency table that has 27 classes is probably not very easy for someone to digest as a quick synopsis of your data. So if the point is to summarize and quickly and effectively organize your data for someone to interpret it, you probably want to keep the number of total classes to a reasonable count. And you want to think then about how big the width needs to be as a function of how large your range is. If you're working with numbers that span a range of 1,000, you're probably gonna need to work with intervals that are 100 wide. But if your range is only a range of 10, then you might be able to do intervals of two or five, depending on how many observations you have and how much uh, you want to break down the data. So it is possible to have too few classes and it is definitely possible to have too many classes. And that just kind of comes down to thinking about how I can effectively summarize this data. I would say two important rules to keep in mind is that we want all of our classes to be equal and it's best practice to close the intervals whenever possible. So what does that mean? Every one of these classes has the same width, three. I didn't make one a width of three and one a width of seven and one a width of five. That's not ideal because it summarizes our data in a somewhat biased way. It makes some things look more common perhaps than they are because I've created a larger class, right? The other thing to think about there is that keeping them closed ensures that we know kind of what the lower and upper limits on our data are, as opposed to not knowing where, for example, if I said, you know, great seven or greater, how high does it go? Um, it's best to keep the, the classes closed and we always want to work to keep them equal. There are a few rare exceptions, but none that we'll deal with in our class, ideally. So this is how we could do something like create a grouped frequency table, making classes by thinking about the real range and designing a class interval and number of classes that's reasonable based on that.